Good afternoon. So we're going to go full, cycle, full circle. We began uh, on Friday talking about health disparities, uh, and we had some national experts uh, from all over uh, the United States, Canada, as well as our own institution. But now we're going to be looking um, at all former fellows who are working in areas of healthcare disparities. I am taking over for Stacey Lindau, who um, had uh, reasons that she was unable to be here today uh, related to health and her family. So our four speakers for this afternoon are going to be uh, Dr. Milda Saunders, who is currently a fellow within the section of hospital medicine, where her research focuses on racial disparities and small area variation. Her work during the McLean Fellowship examined how neighborhood poverty and racial composition affect how long patients must wait to get a renal transplant wait list, and that was actually funded through a program at the University of British Columbia uh, uh, from the Canadian Institute of Health similar to our NIH. She is currently an assistant professor in the section of hospital medicine at the University of Chicago, as well as a new faculty member at the McLean Center. <laughs> the second speaker will be Dr. Catherine Mosley, um, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Communicable Diseases, as well as a clinical bioethicist at the University of Michigan Medical School. She is also co-chair of the Pediatric Ethics Committee. And I'm not sure if I get to credit her or blame her for the fact that I'm still on the American Academy of Pediatrics section on bioethics, where she recruited me uh, like a decade ago. Uh, my third speaker is Elisa Gordon, who um, is a research associate professor at the Institute for Healthcare Studies and the Division of Organ Transplantation at the Feinberg School of Medicine of Northwestern University. And our fourth speaker is Dr. Christy Kirshner, who is a professor of clinical medical humanities and bioethics and also hold the secondary appointment in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the Feinberg School of Medicine. Her focus on disability ethics, specifically concepts of disability and medical decision making, healthcare professional curricula, and healthcare access issues and disparities. And uh, Christy is going to talk about um, her own experience moving from Northwestern um, into the uh, community to be doing um, rehabilitation medicine and the impact of resources and access. So on that note, let's begin with Dr. Saunders. Thank you for your attention today. So um, the title of my talk is, Does Neighborhood Composition Affect Time to Renal Transplant Waitlist? Um, so during our brief time today, um, I'll start with background, research question and methods, um, some results, and then conclusions and next steps. Um, so we know that renal transplant reduces mortality, improves quality of life, and costs less than dialysis for all comers. Um, but the benefits of transplant aren't distributed equally. Um, African Americans comprise about one third of those who receive dialysis, but only one quarter of those who receive deceased donor, trans deceased donor kidneys. Um, and we know that the reasons for the transplant disparities are a variety of many social and biologic factors. However, when we just look at transplant wait list, as opposed to actually receiving the kidney, those disparities still persist. African Americans were less likely than whites to be rated as appropriate candidates for transplantation. And of those deemed appropriate, they were less likely to be referred for evaluation or to be placed on a waiting list. So we know that disparities persist at each step of the process. Further work needs to be done on the causes of those disparities and ways to intervene. One potential way of looking at this is through neighborhood effects. As we learned earlier in our conference, um, there are a variety of um, social and environmental factors, um, and neighborhood plays a role in education, employment, and income outcomes. Social scientists and economists have long known this. Recently, we have turned our attention to the role of neighborhood in health outcomes. Um, neighborhood has been shown to have an effect in above and beyond individual effects on mortality, cardiovascular health, obesity, birth outcomes, and diabetes. So I sought to look at it in terms of transplant waitlist disparities. My research questions were, do neighborhood poverty and racial composition explain part of the black-white disparity in renal transplant waitlist? And do neighborhood poverty and racial composition exert their effects independently, or is one a proxy for the other? So um, I use the US, we use the US Renal Data System, which is a comprehensive um, data set that's publicly available that contains information on practically all of the um, patients in the US um, with end-stage renal disease. 
Um, this was linked to 2000 census data, um, and we looked at both white and black patients who initiated dialysis between January 2000 and December 2006. Subjects' neighborhood were divided into nine strata based on the percent of black residents and the percent poverty. Um, and the racial composition was divided into, um, uh, it was classified as a white neighborhood if they had less than 10% um, of the residents were African American, a mixed neighborhood if between 10 and 60% of the residents were African American, and a predominantly black neighborhood if greater than 60% of the residents were African American. Similarly, for poverty, um, if a neighborhood was classified as poor um, based on the U.S. Um, based on common definitions of poverty, if greater than 20% of the residents were below poverty level, a neighborhood was considered poor. Um, if uh, 5 to 19% of the residents were above the poverty level, it was considered moderate income, and it was wealthy if less than 5% of residents were considered um, below the poverty level. Um, we use Cox proportional hazards um, to determine the association between uh, time to wait list and neighborhood characteristics after adjusting for a variety of demographic and comorbid conditions. So the results. So this slide um, has a lot of data, um, and I can walk, um, walk you through it. So for black residents um, here, um, if we look, we looked at it two ways. So if we divide by the neighborhood racial composition, so within neighborhoods that were predominantly black, as we, um, in, as we decrease poverty, so going from a rich neighborhood, I'm sorry, as we increase poverty, going from a rich neighborhood to a middle income neighborhood to a poor neighborhood, the likelihood of transplant wait lists decreases in a stepwise fashion. Um, this result holds also if you look at um, neighborhoods with a mixed racial composition, as you go from a rich neighborhood to a middle income neighborhood to a poor neighborhood, there's this stepwise decrement. You see it less um, in neighborhoods that are um, predominantly white. Um, and then similarly, if you look at the same data, um, but in a different, from a different angle. So if you look at neighborhoods that were rich, as you increase the proportion of black residents, so in rich neighborhoods here in gray, um, this is the referent group, but as you have um, the stepwise increase in the proportion of African American residents in a neighborhood, you also have this stepwise decrement in likelihood of transplant wait list. Um, and you can see it, again, less for the middle income group, um, but also um, for the uh, poor neighborhoods. So for black patients who live in poor neighborhoods, um, as you um, increase the proportion of African Americans, um, you have this stepwise decrement so that um, black residents who live in neighborhoods that are both poor and predominantly African American have almost, um, they're almost half as likely to be transplant waitlisted as their more um, affluent counterparts or their, more, their counterparts that live in more affluent neighborhoods. Now this is particularly striking um, because in our sample, sort of consistent with the rest of the U.S. population, um, nearly half of our African American residents lived in neighborhoods that were poor and fully one quarter of our sample lived in neighborhoods that were both poor and African American. For white patients, you don't see the same relationship. If you see the gray, you see that living in a wealthy neighborhood um, is, uh, increases your likelihood of transplant wait list. Um, so it's best to live in a wealthy neighborhood, but you don't see the stepwise decrement um, as you either increase um, the poverty in a neighborhood, nor as you increase the proportion of African Americans. So there is some relationship between socioeconomic status, but it's not as um, stepwise. And this is just another way of looking at the data for those who don't like to look at things visually and who wanted to see confidence intervals. You see the same relationship. This is for black patients. Um, as you live in wealthy neighborhoods, you see the stepwise decrement as you increase the proportion of um, African American population. And if you are for within racial categorization, as you increase poverty, you see a decrease in the likelihood of transplant wait list. Um, and similarly, no less of a relationship for um, white patients. So, 
Um, so in conclusion, um, blacks were more likely to live in poor, isolated neighborhoods. So 48% uh, live in poor neighborhoods and 27% live in poor, predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Blacks within these neighborhoods were also less likely to be waitlisted. Um, and so we think that a large part um, neighborhood racial segregation drives um, some component of um, transplant um, disparity, wait, transplant waitlist disparities. Um, and this contributes to the large um, transplant disparity between blacks and whites as a whole. Now, there are limitations to this study. We were unable to fully control for individual characteristics. We had employment and insurance status at the time of dialysis initiation as a proxy. Um, and when we use zip code as a measure for neighborhood, now this is a larger area than some other um, census block group, but we thought for um, a measure like transplant wait list, um, it was an appropriate um, size to look at this effect. Um, and we also have the covariates that were measured at dialysis initiation as opposed to over time. So next steps. Um, future work will focus on how um, neighborhood characteristics influence the likelihood of transplant wait list. Um, we hope to examine social capital, including social support and social networks, as well as the role of dialysis center in um, facilitating or mediating this effect. And I'd like to thank my um, research colleagues and mentors. And thank you for your time. Now, one would think that Milda and I got together to discuss this. Actually, we did not. So this is just wonderful serendipity. And just sort of think of this as one long, continuous talk, maybe. All right. So I'm focusing as a pediatrician, and as a disclaimer, I am not a nephrologist, and I am not a philosopher, and John Lantos said we don't have to be because I'm a clinical bioethicist, so it's okay. So number one, African-American children with end-stage renal disease spend more time on dialysis, receive fewer transplanted kidneys, and die more than white children. And so my question to this group because we are ethicists, is this just sad, but an unavoidable consequence of bad choices, bad genes, bad physiology? Or is this really an injustice that we should address? Now, I can go through this fairly quickly because we had all of yesterday to talk about it, but let me just quickly review for those who weren't there. We all know power, this is not a meritocracy. For those of you who had that strange idea somewhere, this is not a meritocracy. Power, money, resources are distributed according to gender, race, SES, and multiple other things that have nothing to do with how hard you work or how smart you are. Health disparities result, be, and they are defined, and people who work in disparity literature may call them inequities, inequalities. I'm going to use health disparities because it's easier to say. There are avoidable differences avoidable differences in health associated with social and or demographic characteristics that have nothing to do with the physiology of the disease. They result, these disparities result from the social structures that create and maintain, and I'm quoting here from Paula Braverman, unequal opportunities to be healthy, making the disadvantaged groups even more disadvantaged with respect to their health. So my question to this group is, what is the moral obligation to remediate these disparities? Because we all know that justice requires that similar things be treated similarly. So I'm gonna whiz through very briefly what pediatric ESRD really is and what happens. So for children, the gold standard is actually a preemptive transplant, getting the kid before they need to go on dialysis in transplanting them. To do that, you usually need a living donor. And African-American children receive fewer living transplants and have fewer living donors. Now, this transplant workup, for those of you who are not nephrologists, requires multiple appointments, generally over weeks to months. Both the donor and the recipient, the donor's hospital expenses are covered, the recipients are also covered by Medicare, but 
the donor does not get any lost time from work covered. Medicare will pay for three years, count them on the fingers of one hand, three years of immunosuppressant medication, but will pay for unlimited days of dialysis. Children on dialysis don't grow as well, they have worse academic achievement, and they have worse quality of life than children with transplants. Now, people have looked at reasons for the disparities. So, why don't we have living donors? Well, why do fewer living donors volunteer for African-American children? Maybe they don't complete their transplant workups, and in truth, in the adult literature, they don't. The data is not quite as clear for children. Poor adherence. This one we know. African-American children are less adherent to their medications. They don't follow up on their um, clinic visits. It is the nephrologist that has to initiate the transplant workup, and as Dr. Saunders has said, um, they don't get on the list. They are less likely to be for referred for transplant workups. Now, is this a bad thing? I've just told you that African-American families with children with ESRD are non-adherent, and kidneys are scarce resources, and as we have been drummed into, kidneys are scarce resources, and there is a duty, societal duty, not to waste them, to transplant them into someone where they are going to be used well. So if I have someone who is not adherent, someone who's adherent, I'm not being a racist, I am not being anything, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. Or am I? So I raise the question again, are these differences unavoidable or are they unjust? So let's unpack this disparity a little bit. What the heck is going on with non-adherence? Well, long story short, for reasons that have nothing to do with end-stage renal disease, African-American adolescents are more likely to get end-stage renal disease than white children. White children get it either from congenital anomalies and as little toddlers, African-Americans get it in their tween ages or as teenagers. And those of you who have adolescents, you know they are way less adherent than little children because you have no control over them. So more adolescents, adolescents are non-adherent, more African-American children with ESRD are adolescents. Hmm, I wonder where our non-adherence starts to come from missing the follow-up appointments. Ooh, how do we explain that one? Well, for those of you who are clinicians, we know we like our clinics during business hours. We want to have time with our family too, except African-American parents are more likely to have low-wage jobs for reasons that are a little bit too long to go into today. They don't have a lot of flexible time off. They can't just leave to take their child to a doctor's appointment at three o'clock in the afternoon. Fewer living donors. Why are these selfish parents and family members not volunteering their kidneys for their kids? Well, African American children are more likely to have single parents who are the sole support of the household, so unlikely that they're going to be able to take that time off to be a kidney donor for their child. Again, they're likely to have low wage jobs. They don't have time off to recover from the donation. And depending on the time, that, the kind of job that you have, to be a kidney donor, if you have a sedentary job, you may only be away from work for two weeks. If you have a job that requires a lot of physical work, you may need up to six weeks. Six weeks that is not covered, and you may have no job when you come back. Number three, African Americans are more likely to have diabetes, hypertension, obesity, all disqualifiers for organ donation. We already covered that one. So let me bring back to the point again. Are these bad choices? Are they bad genes? Or are these bad barriers? I mean, why, why are these problems? I mean, if you listen to yesterday and listen today, why, why is this affecting more African Americans? If the goods of society are equitably distributed, there should be equal numbers or relatively equal proportions of whites and blacks in poverty having these problems. So why the heck are these giant areas problems for black people? 
why is it that there are proportionally more African Americans in poverty? Let me tell you, or at least try and tell you. So let us go back in time, a little bit of history. So both before and after slavery, there were laws and policies created that created these social structures that systematically disadvantaged African Americans well into the 20th century. Early in the 20th century, it was actually illegal for African Americans to buy a railroad ticket to go north for better jobs. It was illegal for African Americans to own property, to change jobs without the permission of their white employer. So as a result, we had segregated, poor quality schools, housing, medical care, no freedom of choice in employment. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act changed this. But think about it. African Americans and whites have lived here in this country together for nearly 400 years. But our citizen right, citizenship rights have been guaranteed for less than 50. And there has still, to this day, there has never been a systematic nationwide educational program to eradicate racist beliefs. We talk about you can't legislate morality, but we can educate about it. We have never, we have said, you must let us let blacks into your schools, but we've never bothered to change the attitude of, but last week they were our slaves. There is no escape from skin color, because long about now, someone is about thinking, well, golly gee, my relatives arrived here from Romania, Hungary, wherever, and now they are CEOs of whatever. Well, there is a problem with this. And this is a quote from a book that I would commend to you, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. And she says, with the stroke of a pen, many European immigrants could wipe away their ethnicities by adopting Anglo-Saxon surnames. However, a name change would have no effect in masking the ethnicity of blacks. We don't have the option of choosing a more favored identity. Wherever we go, we are black. The effects of these unjust social structures continue into the 21st century. African Americans are more likely to be denied access to good neighborhoods, even though they have income comparable to whites. They're more likely to be offered higher interest mortgages than whites with identical credit scores and incomes. White employers, and those of you who saw CNN's Black in America, flawed as it was, will already know this, white employers are more likely to offer a job to a white male, even one with a criminal record, than a black male with similar qualifications. Even African American men with graduate degrees from Ivy League institutions encounter greater employment barriers than white men. And this one should startle you a little bit. I know it startled me when I first heard about it. So going back into slavery, reconstruction, and so forth, all of these prohibitions against property ownership meant no intergenerational transfer of wealth, no houses to give, no money to <clears throat> give, no store to give. Everyone has to start from scratch. At all income levels, all income levels, African American families have significantly less wealth, and by wealth, not income, assets minus liabilities than white families. Now, prepare to be shocked. In 2002, before the market crashed, before all of the economy going to wherever it went in a handbasket, the poorest white families, and this is talking about incomes less than $16,000 had a net worth, net worth, assets minus liabilities of over $25,000. These are our poorest white families in the United States. Black families, same income, negative net worth, debts greater than assets. Let's go to the top now, and the richest 20%, and now everybody in the room pretty much is rich, I bet you didn't know that, 78,000. The richest African American families have less than a third of the wealth of white families, 31 cents to the dollar. So is it surprising then that things are the way they are? 
the resources necessary to pursue a healthy lifestyle are inequitably distributed. Equal treatment, treating everyone the same, actually perpetuates this inequity. So what I am proposing, not being a philosopher, but being a clinical bioethicist, is a robust and very practical theory of remedial justice. Yesterday we heard about great policy needs and how this could be, but I sit there and I go like, okay, how does this work in the hospital? In the same way we hear about great theories of bioethics and think, how is this working at the bedside? So my stab, and with apologies to Norm Daniels, I'm, I'm so glad he's not here right now, and Ruth Fadden. <laughs> so a remedial justice theory should describe the existing inequities. It should also try and describe the extent of obligatory remediation, but it should work both on the macro policy level and on the micro individual level. There is a precedent for this, and I'm so glad the palliative care panel was before me. The whole issue of patient and family autonomy around end-of-life care was really brought forward by bioethics. And as a result, we had the Patient Self-Determination Act, a, ma a macro remedial justice, and we have palliative care programs, we have all of these end-of-life discussions, micro remedial justice. So let me propose some small examples relative to pediatric end-stage renal disease. Macro. Medicare is only paying for those three years. Hmm. And no, this did not pass during health reform. It was proposed, but it died in committee, this particular amendment. So we still don't have this one. A disproportionate number of African American our adolescents with end-stage renal disease, and this particular problem has a disproportionate effect. It interferes, end-stage renal disease interferes with their education at a time when they're acquiring job skills. They're more likely to have the poor quality education because their parents can't live in the good neighborhoods. Leads to low wage jobs, no benefits. So they're more likely to have graft failure because they can't afford to get the meds without that three years of, after that three years of Medicare. A duh solution, increase the stupid coverage. Make it parity with dialysis. How about a micro example? The poor adherence to appointments. Well, gee, we just talked about the low wage jobs. You don't have time off. You have a single parent, so you don't have a second parent to say, oh, sweetie, I'm at work. Can you take little Johnny to his kidney appointment? No, you are it. So the parents get to choose between, ooh, my child's health or my job that's going to give me money to pay for the food, the housing, and so forth. Wait, is this a trick question? No, it is not. So what can we do about this? How's about some non-traditional clinic hours? How's about doing the transplant workups in a single day? What is nice, or at least what I think is nice about these solutions is that they actually benefit everybody. You don't have to be a poor single mom to benefit from the fact that, wow, I can take my kid in on a Saturday afternoon or an evening and I don't have to skip a day of work. I don't have to find babysitting for the other kids while I take, even if I'm a single, even if I have a mom that stays at home with a rich husband. This is easier for everyone. I don't have to worry about my immunosuppressant medications. This is easier for everyone, not just the poorest off. Bioethics, as we have learned, is theoretical and clinical, and these solutions to health disparities requires both together. So in summary, these invisible social structures created by discrimination and racism, disadvantage African Americans disproportionately, deprives them of the resources that they need to live and pursue a healthy lifestyle. This is an injustice, and this is what we do. We are bioethicists, we, are we deal with injustice, we figure out ways to help moral theory, 
deal with injustice, and this is a clear injustice. So we need a remedial justice theory that works. We need some practical compensatory mechanisms. So I would like to thank my collaborators and people who gave me great comments this, on this in University of Michigan. And thanks for staying awake. I'm Elisa Gordon. I'm going to be speaking today about um, a culturally competent Hispanic transplant program that we have at Northwestern University and um, its impact and its focus on Hispanics and its impact on increasing knowledge about living donation and uh, positive attitudes about living donation and transplantation among Hispanics. But let me give you a little bit of background as to why this culturally competent program is necessary. Um, living donor kidney transplantation, as you very well know, is the optimal treatment for patients with end-stage renal disease. Um, and there are considerable racial ethnic disparities in access to living donors, um, which thus undermines even further the benefits of potentially obtaining a living donor kidney transplant for Hispanics and other minority groups. Uh, Hispanics with renal failure receive disproportionately fewer living kidney donors compared to non-Hispanic whites, 33% versus 45%, and Hispanics comprise 18% of all candidates waiting for a kidney, but only 13.9% of all kidney donors in 2009 were Hispanic. Um, there are a number of reasons for these disparities in Hispanics um, that have been attributed to the provider, to Hispanic members of the public, as well as Hispanic patient-related factors. Um, provider factors pertain to delayed referral to nephrologists, delayed listing for transplant. Um, among the members of the broader Hispanic public, there are concerns about the lack of knowledge about transplantation and living donation as an option, fear, distrust, negative attitudes about living donation, religious and cultural beliefs that the body needs to be whole in order for the resurrection to occur, or that God doesn't necessarily support it, or the church doesn't necessarily support organ donation and transplantation. Um, and then more specifically among the patient level, there are concerns that um, discomfort with actually asking family members or talking with family about the um, option of living donation and transplantation in general. Many people feel reluctant to um, ask people to donate and there's an expectation that uh, family members would come to them as opposed to the patient seeking out a family member to donate. So um, culturally competent education is very much necessary um, in order to address uh, Hispanic patients and families' uh, concerns, worries, misconceptions, and myths about living donation, and as well as to ensure that uh, Hispanics are fully informed about their treatment options, including living donation. So the, under, the assumption is that um, the more that people know about their options and have the ability to engage uh, in discussions, then there, that may increase the likelihood of pursuing living donation. Um, let me just give you a, a, a definition. I have three definitions here. One is on culture, one is on, oh goodness, this is high up. Culture, culturally competent, cultural competency, and linguistic competency. I'm just going to give you the definition of cultural competency in the sake of time. Um, that pertains to a set of values, principles, behaviors, attitudes, policies, and structures that enable organizations and individuals to work effectively in cross-cultural situations. So um, now I'm going to describe for you in more depth what the Hispanic transplant program is like at Northwestern. Um, it was instituted in 2006, the end of the year, and it mirrors very much what we have going on for the English program with the same kinds of structures and processes and organization. Um, as the English speaking program, and it addresses in many ways the cultural values and beliefs and needs of the Hispanic patient population. Um, and what's great is um, I was able to do some, about 10 interviews with members of the Hispanic transplant program there and found that in many ways, and in, actually in, in its entirety, its qualities or characteristics of what made that program or makes it culturally competent map 
really nicely onto the National Quality Forum's framework for standardizing the measurement and reporting of high quality of culturally competent care. So the NQF, National Quality Forum, developed this framework for hospitals to use in order to develop their own culturally competent programs for whatever kind of clinical care it may be. So it just so happens that um, our program has the leadership, the support, the, the drive, um, and the institutional support for this Hispanic program. Um, it's integrated into our systems. I can give you examples of all of these um, at a later point, but just to highlight a couple items, um, and I'll get into the um, specifics in a moment too, um, we um, have like 25 uh, members of the program who are bilingual, bicultural staff. All of the um, discussions are conducted in Spanish. All the written materials are in Spanish. Um, we seek out um, the referrals by primary care physicians um, and nephrologists, but really accents, accenting the PCPs because more Hispanics go to them and they speak Spanish. Um, here's a really cool thing. We say to patients who are calling up and saying, hey, we'd like to uh, start um, an evaluation. Our, some water. We say to them, um, come and bring your entire family. We don't say, oh, just um, come and bring your donor with you, because that's going to put off a lot of people and put off a lot of the um, Hispanics who might say, oh, I'm feeling singled out. But bring your family, bring grandma with you. This is what the director of the program, who's from Colombia, Dr. Caicedo, has instituted this. And he's, he explained it to me that um, by bringing grandma, the elders, the entire family, their support for the patient. And bringing the elders along is a culturally competent component in and of itself who grant legitimacy for living donation um, as an option to the rest of the family who might be interested in pursuing it. Um, I'm going to move on. I can go into these details in more depth if you're interested. Um, we did find some um, really nice um, rates in terms of our living donor rates among the Hispanic patients. Um, in 2007, the rate was 62.8 and it increased to 78%. And this is in comparison to the national rate which was in 2007, 33.7, and 2008, 33.5. So um, Northwestern is one of the um, leading institutions with regard to rates of living donation. And you know, for, his, for that to also be mirrored in the Hispanic uh, patients who we're seeing is, is a wonderful um, thing in and of itself. Um, so more specifically, um, with regard to the communication, um, we have uh, one of the first days that patients are told to come to the program is what's called TOA, the Transplant Evaluate Orientation and, Trans and Evaluation Day. And it involves a couple sessions um, back to back um, in person where the patients and their families and, and their friends are also invited to come and receive education about um, donation and transplantation, the risks, benefits, alternatives, and processes. And, they get to uh, hear Dr. Caicedo speak about this for um, about 40 minutes to an hour for each session. And the first session is for everyone. Then, um, then the patients go and start getting evaluated in the exam room um, while the family members and friends continue on to hear the second session. And um, so what we did was did pre-test, post-test surveys um, or we set out, let me just tell you the aims, we set out to assess the impact of these educational sessions on knowledge about living donation, attitudes about living donation, satisfaction with these sessions and the information provided, and the value that uh, participants placed on the culturally competent care provided. Okay, so we did uh, surveys um, immediately before the first session and then um, immediately after each respective session. Um, approximately, um, just so you have an, a sense of this, a, about 10 patients come each month and these sessions occur monthly. So over the course of 10 months we did the surveys um, and for each patient I would say that um, 
up to five family members slash friends come with them, on average about three. And so um, we had a very high participation rate. Uh, we approached um, uh, 175, 160 consented, 91%. Um, due to incomplete surveys, we, our final sample, sample was 137 participants. And um, briefly, it was a relatively young population, half. Uh, they were divided in gen by gender. Um, everyone who's Hispanic, uh, majority, 78% were first generation, mostly from Mexico. And um, only 45% had completed high school or more. Um, 85% had a total income of up to 35,000, so the socioeconomic status was relatively low. Um, and then family, friends indicated how they related to patients. Most, a third of them were the adult child of the patient, 22% were spouse, and so on. Um, so with regard to knowledge and attitudes, we found a significant increase in the knowledge gained as well as the attitudes becoming more positive toward living donation. And this was apparent for both the patients and for the family members. And um, one of the things that was really interesting for me was to see that what specific knowledge items um, were people um, learning the most. Um, so we had um, about 20 true, false, multiple choice questions, and it turns out that they um, learned the percent change between the pretest and the post-test, found that uh, the items that they learned the most pertain to the potential donors can donate even if they are not a match for their intended recipient. And another item being that living donors are given priority if they need a kidney transplant in the future. Um, by contrast, we were interested, well, what were the items that they had a harder time learning and that would require even greater efforts <coughs> to educate people in the future at our institution and perhaps at other institutions? And um, some of the issues were the complications from donating a kidney that seemed to be confusing and um, the expected time for donors to walk following surgery, so recovery issues. We are also interested in uh, satisfaction with the program in terms of did it address your informational needs and satisfaction overall, as well as the value that the uh, participants placed on having um, a clinician or the clinicians in the program who, could, who were bilingual and bicultural Hispanic and background and um, both patients and families were very uh, rated it very highly uh, though we found that patients rated um, their satisfaction and cultural competency scores uh, significantly higher than the families um, this is a lot of data and um, just to highlight a couple things um, the we were wondering who are the patients and who are the family members who um, gain the most knowledge or increase their attitudes the most uh, we found that um, the family members who were younger and had uh, more education were the ones who um, gained the most in knowledge and favorable attitudes so i'll just highlight those um, so just to conclude here, our study demonstrated the efficacy of a culturally and linguistically competent <laughs> educational program in increasing Hispanic patients and family members' knowledge about living donation and favorable attitudes about donation. And these sessions increased all of the participants' levels of knowledge. We found that um, at baseline, there was a strong need for widespread education about donation and transplantation in the Hispanic patient and family populations, um, though um, some, on some items they already had high levels of knowledge regarding, for example, that people can live with one kidney. Um, but future efforts should focus on educating families and patients about transplant facts for which they showed uh, minimal baseline knowledge and uh, minimally improved comprehension between the baseline and post-test surveys. Um, and, and other transplant centers have expressed interest um, in modeling their centers after ours and adopting some of our techniques 
to make theirs more culturally and linguistically competent for their own Hispanic patient population. So um, there are some things that they could do to improve um, their own uh, study, their own um, patients and families' knowledge, like focusing on how kidneys from living donors last longer than kidneys from deceased donors, and that living donors receive priority for a transplant should they need one in the future. And I'm just going to skip this here. Um, with regard to future research, I propose that it would really help to identify which culturally competent elements within the Hispanic transplant program contribute the most to patients and families' knowledge and attitudes and readiness to ask someone to, know, to donate. So this would help with future replica, replicability of our program and dissemination elsewhere. Um, it would help to determine whether the program elements disseminated, disseminated elsewhere would also lead to similar kinds of results and to assess the impact of a culturally and linguistically competent program on living donor rates. And I'd like to acknowledge my um, colleagues and collaborators, and uh, thank you very much for listening. I think I'm the caboose for the afternoon. Um, thank you all for sticking around. My talk is, um, more of a personal journey that I'd like to share with you. I'm going to be talking a bit about a move I've made this year where I left the Gold Coast or the Magnificent Mile where I worked for about 23 years and I've moved to the Lawndale community. And just to give you a sense of the tra trajectory of my career, I started as a medical student here at the University of Chicago. I was the first um, medical student that chose rehabilitation as a career, uh, raised a lot of eye, uh, eyebrows and questions in people's mind, um, and we all know what a sexy career it is. <laughs> so I went to um, Northwestern in 1987, where I was a resident, and I graduated in 90. And at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, I was offered the opportunity to stay on as an attending physician my passion at that time was neurological disability. I liked working with the whole neuroaxis, brain injury, spinal cord injury, strokes. I've uh, worked a lot with neuromuscular disease, cerebral palsy, um, spina bifida. So I did that for uh, several years and became increasingly interested in reproductive health care issues for disabled women and had the opportunity to found and be the medical director for a uh, disabled women's center for a number of years. And it was really through those first formative years of practice that I began to see ethics everywhere. So I'd been in Mark's class as a medical student, um, and I was feeling a bit at a loss that the kinds of issues I was seeing and experiencing in rehabilitation medicine weren't issues I felt particularly well equipped articulate and to think through. So I did come to University of Chicago in 94-95, completed my fellowship, and decided I really wanted to spend time trying to map the land landscape of what I was calling disability ethics. I was fortunate to be given an endowed chair when I came back to the Rehab Institute, which helped support my work uh, in both ethics and women's work and um, held that chair up until I left RAC in 2009. Um, I had incredible support and resources through the years, not just Mark, but Dr. Betts, uh, Strawn Donnelly, uh, a number of people who really helped me um, through that period of time and to have opportunities to do some very interesting and energizing work. But as I was, um, Moving through the years, we've been doing disability ethics for about 15 years, I was taking a step back and thinking about what was my perception now of the most pressing issues? Where were the greatest needs, the most pressing issues, and what I was beginning to think of as translational bioethics? How was I going to take this from the realm of theoretical to actually trying to have an impact? So this gives you a sense of why I did move to the Lawndale community. For those of you who don't live in Chicago, the Magnificent Mile is a beautiful area along Michigan Avenue and the lakefront. 
Um, it's a wealthy community. The average household income is about 129,000. It's predominantly white, educated, employed. There's a low crime rate there, and there's just beautiful, abundant parks and shopping and restaurants in the area. The Lawndale community is a community on the west side, and its average household income is about a third less, predominantly black and Hispanic. It's a large blue-collar population, and there's a high unemployment rate. There's also a very high crime rate in Lawndale. And it's one of those areas we've learned to call food deserts. Um, not a lot of grocery stores, few shops, not many public places and spaces for children to play. So this slide, slide just gives you a sense of where I'm talking about the geography. We're about six miles southwest of the Gold Coast. Um, so these are some side-by-side -side pictures. Um, Ralph Lauren on the, Michi on the Michigan Avenue, close to the Rehab Institute and Northwestern Memorial Hospital. The um, shop on the right is one of the shops that I pass as I'm driving to Lawndale. One of the things I miss in the Lawndale neighborhood are the wonderful coffee shops and places to run and get a, a great cup of tea. This is an example of Argo Tea. Uh, we have abundant restaurants and coffee shops in the Northwestern um, campus. This is an example, again, of the, the sorts of food deserts we see in Lawndale, um, a small grocery store that accepts link cards. So these are the hospitals. And I am um, wanting to emphasize that a lot of what I've begun to think about these issues have to do with the differences of missions of types of hospitals. So the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago is on the left. The hospital I'm currently working at is on the right, Schwab Rehabilitation Hospital. There are only three freestanding rehab hospitals in the Chicago area. And Schwab is a, um, a hospital that I've known about for years. Many of the doctors are trained at the Rehabilitation Institute. Um, when you look at the differences between the hospital, RIC is a very prominent hospital. It's been judged the number one rehab hospital for 20 year, years by U.S. News and World Report. It's a tertiary care academic medical center. We're embedded in the Northwestern University um, Medical Center with Northwestern Memorial Hospital uh, right next door. We're one of the largest physical medicine and rehabilitation residency programs. And the uh, main hospital uh, is 150 beds. There are also 30 sites of care outside of that main hospital. It provides a wide array of rehabilitation services. So we're talking about what I call core services, stroke, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, amputations. But it also has a lot of specialty care services like uh, rehabilitation for pelvic floor weakness, incontinence after uh, pregnancy and childbirth, or uh, cancer rehab, and chronic pain, and uh, musculoskeletal and sports rehab. So a lot of depth in terms of a specialty rehab. Schwab, on the other hand, is also a tertiary care, embedded in a tertiary care medical center, but it's not affiliated with the large university. It does have a residency. It's about a third the size of the Rehab Institute, and it's got an affiliation with the University of Chicago. It's about half the size in terms of the number of beds. It does have both acute and subacute, which um, RIC does not have a subacute unit. And there are two other sites of care. They're both trauma centers, which I think is also important to point out. Trauma centers in Chicago, number four. We've got um, Northwestern, Sinai Health Systems, Cook County, and Christ Hospital. So in terms of the demographics of the hospital, um, Schwab is predominantly African American. The Rehab Institute has predominantly white patients. In terms of the breakdown of insurance, the major difference here is between the Medicaid patients. We have many more Medicaid patients at Schwab than the Rehab Institute of Chicago. And that number is even elevated a bit here because of uh, the number of Medicare patients that we have on the subacute unit. But for me, the, the biggest reason why I ended up moving has to do with the missions of the medical centers. So RIC is just a phenomenal facility, and it um, has incredible research and um, training experiences for physicians, 
but its, its mission is really to focus on the high-tech end of rehabilitation, to advance human ability through science and research. And you see the picture here at the bottom of a man who's been in the news a lot over the last few years for the bionic arm. So it was at the Rehab Institute of Chicago that they figured out how to connect a prosthesis to nerves in the chest wall and to be able to activate um, thoughts that could control a prosthesis. So it was a very exciting sorts of work. Um, in the community I moved to, we are part of the Sinai Health System, and their mission is really to be the national model for the delivery of urban health care. Um, Schwab itself specifically says, well, because life doesn't stop for disability. So if you compare the research foci of both of the institutions, on the Magnificent Mile, again, we, we were working on the bionic arm, we've got lots of virtual reality work going on, locomats, we've now got a study doing stem cell uh, research, phase one stem cell research for spinal cord injury, lots of work on different kinds of robotic therapies, particularly in stroke, and uh, a lot of rehabilitation outcomes research. In Lawndale, a lot of the research is just focused around what's called the extended care services. So a disability resource center to help people with housing, transportation, um, employment. The community tech center is a center that's wheelchair accessible, that teaches people with disabilities how to use computers and tries to get them prepared for vocational services. The peer mentoring program is an extraordinary program there. Every patient with a spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury is assigned a person who's a peer mentor. They are employed by the hospital and they follow patients throughout the hospital stay and they also, in the spinal cord injury program, will continue to maintain contact for six months. So they're there to be sort of the guides to help people through the rehabilitation process as well as what life is like on the other side. In my shoes, is a violence prevention program. It's uh, young men with spinal cord injuries from gunshot wounds who go out into the schools and the surrounding communities and talk about um, their lives and, and try to be a force for preventing gang violence. HIV prevention and then death access. And this is one of the sort of secrets about the Sinai healthcare system. It has the most incredible communication programs of any hospitals I've ever seen. It's got the largest death access program with three sign language interpreters on staff as well as three signing physicians. And they've got 12 video relay network programs. About 30% of the patients don't speak English as the primary language, so they have a very rich array of uh, translation services. The other area of research within the system is the Sinai Urban Health Institute. And I just want to tell you a bit about this because this program was something that was really very interesting to me. I was hearing little pieces about it over the last 10 years before I moved um, to this community, but they have built a program of 32 staff members from the public health world, epidemiologists, research assistants, uh, a large network of clinical educators. Uh, they were doing community-based research, I think, before we really knew that kind of buzzword, um, and statisticians. And they've been looking at, they did door-to-door -door neighborhood mapping of the health issues in six neighborhoods in the Chicago area that varied quite dramatically by income and by racial makeup. Um, they identified what some of the most pressing healthcare issues were, and they've been doing projects for the last 10 years, really working on these. So things like asthma, breast cancer, HIV, um, diabetes and obesity work. And so what kind of work has come out of this? Uh, what kind of results? Well, they found, for instance, that if you're an African-American man in North Lawndale, your life expectancy is about seven years less than average men in Chicago. African-American women with breast cancer are about 117% more likely to die of their breast cancer than white women. About a quarter of the children in North Lawndale have asthma, and there's a lot less access to drugs and many more ER visits in the racial minority groups and lower uh, SES levels. And they found a very high percentage of Puerto Ricans in Chicago have diabetes. So I'm hearing about this research and I'm thinking about what am, I, what am I reading and learning and experiencing in my own work around people with disabilities? What are those issues that um, were becoming much more prominent in my attention? Well, people with disabilities, I've always known, are more likely to live in poverty. There's some very dramatic data about the income levels of people with disabilities. They're also disproportionately represented in racial and ethnic minority groups. 
they're more likely to have publicly funded insurance. So issues of Medicare, Medicaid coverage really matter when you're working with people with disabilities. They're also very high users of the healthcare system and they're less satisfied overall with their healthcare experiences. And we know that the numbers are growing uh, as we have an ever aging population and we have technological advances in care for people who are surviving who previously would have died. So what about now when I take the intersection of disability, race, and ethnicity and I look at what sorts of issues um, are we learning? Well, we're learning that there are higher rates of arthritis disability in older blacks and Hispanic patients, that, that black patients, this study was uh, about two months ago and it's quite shocking to me, black patients with muscular dystrophies die 10 years younger than their white counterparts. And you look at these ages, 23 versus 33 years, that's a third of their lives. Um, blacks have more than twice the average specific death rates from stroke than whites aged less than 75 years. This has really been hitting me home since I've made the move. Um, I've, I've written a piece that's in the current issue of the Hastings Center Report about One City, Two Worlds, where I talk about the number of patients I'm seeing who have their strokes, late 40s, 50s, did not have health insurance, and they're diagnosed at the time of their stroke with their hypertension and their diabetes. And then we start looking at ways to get them into the healthcare system. So oftentimes we'll start the process of getting them public aid. It can take three months or longer to get them public aid approved. And so then we're trying to get them healthcare for their stroke during a window of time which is particularly important in terms of care. It's a very difficult problem. Um, we know that uh, African Americans and Hispanics also have a lower age at death when they do have strokes. The issue of the spinal cord injury is a very interesting one. And remember, again, I said um, both medical centers are trauma centers. Sinai sees a very large number of patients who have gunshot wounds from gang violence. And if you look nationally at the percentage of African American and Hispanics uh, with spinal cord injury, that number is increasing and they're much more likely to have acquired their injuries from violence. So compared 46% uh, of African Americans versus 43% Hispanic, 7% for whites. Those are very dramatic numbers. So when I think about, again, sort of what uh, visually uh, occurs to me as I look at these two environments, one of the uh, areas of the Gold Coast that most inspired me was the Chagall. And if you're ever down on the Northwestern campus or by the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, do walk into the lobby. There is a gorgeous Chagall tapestry. It was Chagall's last work. It hangs from the center uh, of the ceiling in the lobby of the Rehab Institute. It's the, st the story of Job. It is absolutely gorgeous and it was meant to cap capture the suffering that many people who experience disabilities might be feeling when they first come to a rehabilitation setting. The picture on, the, on your right is a picture I pass every day uh, as I'm going to Schwab. And it's extraordinarily poignant. Uh, it's a mural that says, RIP, rest in peace, little John. It's, it's obviously a memorial for a young man who was killed. And when I think about um, the Lawndale community and the patients we care for, I think that the issue of what's happening with African American men in our society felt to me before I moved there to be an urgent issue. Now it feels almost like an emergency. You know, when you look at education, you look at employment, you look at the rates of imprisonment, you look at the rates of violence, and you look at the health care status, I think it's an egregious situation. But there's also beauty, lots of beauty in both places. And I couldn't show you a lot of pictures of the interior of the hospital. It's got an old wing and a new wing in Lawndale. And even though it has a lot fewer resources, it's quite a beautiful facility. Um, on the left is what a patient would see from the window on the Gold Coast looking out at the lake, a beautiful view. On the right, they built a rooftop garden on the uh, new wing of Schwab which has flowers, koi fish, a wheelchair accessible ba basketball court. It's absolutely gorgeous and it's a place that people love to go, patients, family, staff, 
Um, it, it's an urban oasis within uh, what can at times be a fairly um, difficult uh, community and environment. So for me, this has been a move because as I've looked over my career and I've thought a lot about ethics and um, what really matters in terms of the care of people with disabilities, I've come to think of the issues of self-determination or autonomy, which we talk a lot about in ethics, as being absolutely contingent upon social justice issues. You can't talk about self-determination and autonomy if you don't have reasonable choices, if you don't have opportunities. So for me, this move is to really focus more on the social determinants and to look at healthcare access and try to figure out how we can go further upstream in terms of even preventing disability. These patients who are having strokes, these patients who are having amputations, we need to be intervening earlier to try to prevent that. So that's one big piece of um, why I moved. And I'm also still working at Northwestern in Medical Humanities and Bioethics because the other thing that I feel quite passionate about is the need to do a lot more on disability curriculum and healthcare service training. I think across the board, whether we're talking about physicians, nurses, allied health professionals, uh, we need to be doing a lot more to teach about disability and healthcare issues. So that's my, my new life, and I hope at some point in the future, I'll have some more information to share about concretely the work we're doing. Right now, we're working on developing an institute on health disparities and disability over in the Lawndale community. Thank you. Now, this is not necessarily something I agree with, but this is something that always comes up. If the patient no longer needs dialysis because they receive a transplant, then they... That's uh, one less I'm sorry? That's one less chair. That's one less chair than you feel. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't um, be so cynical, and I am sometimes cynical, as to think that that is the reason that people are not referring their patients. I, I do think that people who work in underserved communities um, as primary care physicians, as nephrologists, as uh, transplant social workers really do want the best for their patients. Um, but that is one reason that's been involved. 